to wear next. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity and welcome to everybody in the room. Oh no, I'm on now. <laughs> That's better, isn't it? Anyway, right, so a big welcome to Labour Women's Declaration Fringe event, Wear Next. And welcome to everybody in the room and also welcome to uh, people that are watching because we are being streamed live on LWD's YouTube. So if you are using um, social media to report on this uh, wonderful event, you can use the hashtag LWD Liverpool. Have I lost myself again? No. Am I there now? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so welcome everybody. Look, it's a great honour to sit beside these three very, very brave women. We have Reem al Salem, we've got Dr Anna Hutchinson, and we've got the uh, wonderful Sonia Soda. Now, four years ago, 2021, at the Ship Hotel in Brighton, I was fortunate enough to chair LWD's first conference fringe meeting on fairness and women in sport. And we were outside the secure zone and had to contend with some pretty intimidating protest outside. And the weather, if I remember correctly, was very similar to today. <laughs> but inside the packed hall, there was a great atmosphere of sisterhood and solidarity. And that was, you know, a commitment to, um, you know, everybody that had organised the event and also being able to speak up for women and girls which is incredible, I'm very proud to do so, and that has really grown since then. But I, I said it then, and I'm gonna say it again now, on this platform and in this room, we don't all agree with each other on many different things, and also on how to achieve women's liberation, and not on how we can achieve a just society for all. In fact, Sonia and I argue often. Um, <laughs> but that's what is healthy about our democracy, and we have to celebrate that because what we do agree on is point three on Labour Women's Declaration that women have the right to discuss policies that affect us without being abused, harassed or intimidated. And all three of our speakers have been totally uncompromising in their commitment to speak up, to explain, to educate and to stand up for women and girls, and young people in particular. Now, tomorrow, LWD at seven o'clock is holding a major fringe meeting on a how to build a trade union and labour movement which works for women, with speakers from Phileas Union for Women Project, Southall Black Sisters, and the Women Budget Group, Tracy Gilbert MP, and uh, also the formidable minister, Jess Phillips. Registration for this event is essential, as it's taken outside of the conference zone. It's gonna cost you a little five pound for the meeting because it's also followed by a reception, buffet and bar and a chance to con con continue the very important conversations that we're starting today. Our party has come a very, very long way since 2021. This meeting is inside the conference zone and LWD has finally got a stall in the exhibition hall. Yeah. And there are so many people that you know are in this room that have been part of that conversation to make that reality happen. And I'd just like to thank you from the bottom of my heart. <coughs> the party has moved away from self-ID as a policy and has made three important policy commitments which we are all rightly very proud of. One, to implement the cash review in full. Two, to protect the single sex exceptions in the 2010 Equality Act. And three, to halve male violence against women and girls in a decade. Now our speakers are going to focus on the question, what strategies are now needed in order to deliver these three excellent commitments? They'll present their views and evidence about the need to clarify sex in law in order to both safeguard single sex protections, for example, women's sport and refuges, and also to clarify the protected characteristic of same sex sexual orientation. The potential effect on the single sex protections of making gender recognition certificates easier to obtain, we're going to discuss that, and also the potential effect of the proposed conversion practice ban bill on the successful implementation of the cast review. But first we're gonna hear from Sonia Soda, Chief Lead Writer 
at uh, the Observer, who's going to talk about the Equality Act and gender recognition reform. Then we're going to hear from Dr. Anna Hutchinson, who many of us feel that we already know her from reading Hannah Barnes's book, Time to Think. And congrats to Hannah Barnes, who is here on your recent award. So well done. those of you that don't know, uh, Anna is a clinical psychologist specialising in adolescent mental health and physical health with a particular interest in gender related distress in young people. Now she's part of the team providing induction training to all clinical staff who will be working in the new children and young people's gender dysphoria services in England, so well done you. Um, and finally, our keynote speaker is Reem al -Salem. UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls. And we are honoured, really, truly honoured, Dream, um, to, you know, the, we're honoured to be the first to be able to welcome you to this Labour Party conference. So a big welcome from all of us. Your work around the world and your recent reports on your UK visit on women's safety in sport is it's just phenomenal what you do when we really look forward to hearing from you uh, uh, and throughout the conference as well. So first of all, we're going to go to Sonia, and uh, over to you, Sonia. Thanks so much, uh, Tonya. Is, is my mic working? Yeah, people can hear me. Fantastic. Um, and I just want to start off by saying, first of all, what an honour it is to be uh, here speaking on this Labour Women's Declaration panel. Uh, Tonya's talked about the achievements of uh, Reem and Anna. Can you just stand up, please? We'd love to Oh yeah, sure, I can do that, no worries. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's an honour to be on a panel with both Reem and Anna, but I also want to say a huge thank you uh, to Tonya, who has been a fantastic advocate for women's rights in Parliament, and I think we are all very, very lucky to have her. We're also very lucky to have Labour Women's Declaration, who have been working constructively with the Labour Party on the issue of women's sex-based rights. So um, thank you so much to them. For, um, for hosting this event and bringing us all together. Uh, so what I wanted to sort of use the few minutes that I'm going to talk today was really to talk about why I and many others, including um, senior equalities lawyers, think that the Equality Act needs clarifying uh, to... Uh, uh, clarifying to uh, make clear that sex in the Equality Act means biological sex as opposed to any other definition of sex. Um, and uh, that the reason why it's so important um, is that there's a huge amount at stake when it comes to the clarity of law and uh, what the law means to providers, some of them very small, providing services on the ground and their ability to know when it's lawful, and in fact, when it may be unlawful, so when it's lawful to provide single-sex spaces, sports, and services for women, um, and when in fact it may be unlawful not to make that offer available to women. So to explain that, uh, and apologies if this gets slightly technical, I actually spent uh, this morning swatting up on the Equality Act on Michael Foran's very good policy exchange paper because it is so complicated, and even though I've written about this issue several times, I always have to swat up on it if I'm going to be writing about it again or, or talking about it. Um, but to, to start off, I just need to explain uh, the Equality Act. I'm sure lots of you are very familiar with it. The Equality Act was a landmark piece of legislation passed by the Labour government in 2010. It's something I think that the Labour Party should be incredibly proud of. It brought together a lot of existing legislation and created new legislation and new rights. And really, it sets out, it's the place in law that sets out protections against discrimination on the basis of nine protected characteristics. One of those pr protected characteristics is sex. That's, where, that's what provides rights to women and also indeed men. It's, it's not lawful to discriminate against men unless you've got a very good reason. Another protected characteristic is gender reassignment. That's a protected characteristic that, that quite rightly protects, but, uh, provides very robust protections against discrimination for trans people. And indeed, I think it's really important to note that the UK is actually a leader when it comes to trans rights and protections against discrimination when you compare it to other countries, for example, the US. Um, a third of those protected characteristics is, is sexual um, orientation. 
And what the Equality Act does, it makes it unlawful to discriminate against people based on those characteristics, but it also sets out the circumstances under which it's lawful to provide single-sex services, spaces, and sports. And then it does kind of a range of other things, um, which uh, I, I won't go into. So you might think it's simple, because the Equality Act has sex as a protected characteristic. But the big question and lack of clarity in law at the moment is what does sex mean? So does it mean somebody's biological sex, so whether you're biologically male or female? Or does it mean your, what's termed a, as your legal sex? So to understand that, there's another piece of legislation which I'm sure uh, many of you will also be familiar with called the 2004 Gender Recognition Act. It predates the Equality Act by six years. And what that piece of legislation does is give people uh, the right to change their, the way they are treated, so to be treated as though they are of the opposite sex in law for most but not all legal purposes if they go through um, a gender recognition uh, process. And the lack of clarity in the Equality Act is the protected characteristic of sex. So does, the, does female extend to people who are biologically female, or does it also include people who are male who've been through the gender recognition process and got a certificate that says, for most, but not all purposes, so certainly not for inheritance, but for most purposes in the eyes of the law, they should be treated as though they were female. It doesn't change their actual sex, it changes um, the way they should be treated um, in the eyes of the law. And we don't know, basically. There's no clarity um, in the law on it. It, on some readings of the Equality Act, it, it defines a woman as a female of any age, a man of, or, or, or an adult um, female of any age, a man as um, somebody male. Um, but because we don't know what male and female means, that opens the door to ambiguities. And we know that, what, how do we know the law is unclear? First of all, very senior lawyers argue about it and what it means. <laughs> But also, there's some very important cases making their way through the courts. Um, the, the best that we've got to go on so far is a reading from the Scottish courts, which says um, that sex actually means legal sex in, for the Equality Act in, in most cases, except where it doesn't really make sense. <laughs> it's not a very satisfactory legal reading, um, but that is now being appealed to the Supreme Court. We expect a reading on that uh, later this year, um, potentially next year. Um, I'm just thinking where we are, um, and we, we're not quite sure what that ruling um, is going to say. Lawyers that I've spoken to, you know, it's very hard to predict what the Supreme Court's going to say in any case. Um, obviously, the best case scenario is, from, our, from my perspective and many women's perspective, would be that they come out and say sex means biological sex. The lawyers I've spoken to say it's far more likely that we might get a ruling which says where basically the Supreme Court bounces it back to Parliament and to mm -hmm. MPs and says, look, the law isn't clear on this, it's a problem, but actually it's not for us to determine that Parliament needs to make this clear. So a lot of people think that that's, um, that's the most likely outcome. Why does this matter when it comes back to what I was saying about understanding the parameters in law around single-sex services, spaces and sports? It's also really, really key for the protected characteristic of sexual orientation, which is determinant on the definition of sex, because does same-sex attraction mean that if you're female, you're attracted to somebody female, or does it mean you're attracted to somebody who self-defines as female? That's a very, very key issue uh, for a lot of lesbians that I know um, and speak to about this. And what we do know is that if the Scottish courts have got it right, which is that sex means legal sex, not biological sex, that changes the parameters around when it becomes lawful to exclude people who are male, but who identify as female, from female-only spaces and services. And it's quite technical. I spent a lot of time talking to lawyers. In fact, lawyers actually disagree about the precise legal meaning. Um, but many lawyers think it changes the legal threshold at which you can exclude somebody male who identifies as female. So if sex means biological sex, it doesn't matter whether somebody male has a G or C or not and identifies as female. It is the same threshold to exclude them. And actually, it's quite a simple legal threshold because we know under the Equality Act, it's legal to provide um, female-only services. In fact, in some cases, it's probably unlawful not to offer a woman, for example, a rape survivor 
driver who says she wants a female only service it was it's probably unlawful in the law not to make a female only service available to her if, if you're able to do that resource wise etc so um it's it, it so so it it's much simpler if sex means legal sex it becomes far more complicated in law for a small service to show that it is um, lawful to exclude somebody male who's got a GRC who identifies um, as female. And what we know is that actually in a world where you've got organisations like Stonewall who've been going out and misinforming about the law, they've been telling services that actually to be compliant with the law they need to organise based services based on gender identity, self-ID, rather than someone's biological sex. So there's a lot of misinformation about the law. There's a lot of confusion. We've got a history where actually in the past, if you look at some of the guidance from the statutory regulator under its old leadership, that isn't really legally accurate either. The HRC is in a far better place now. But huge misinformation out there. And services are scared about getting sued. So what it, me what it means is that it makes it much, much more difficult to justify providing single-sex services because the law isn't clear on it and people are scared of getting, uh, getting sued. But it does really put a small charity between a rock and a hard place because it may well be unlawful for them not to provide female-only services as well for women who want and need them. And there's a very important case that's making it way, its way through the courts at the moment in Brighton in relation to the Survivors Network where a female survivor of sexual violence is suing, I think it's Brighton Council, it might be the charity itself, I can't remember which one, but suing them basically on the basis that it was unlawful for them not to make some form of female-only service um, available to her. And this is really substantively important. We don't need, I don't need to explain it to women in this room, I'm sure, but it is a matter of women's basic rights, privacy, dignity, and safety that we, if we want to access female only services where we are vulnerable, where we are undressing, uh, where we are at risk, that we should be able to do so. That is something that is very, very clear for me and a lot of women um, that I know. And so that, that confusion in the law really um, does need clarifying. There are other things that it affects as well. It's not just um, single sex uh, spaces, services and sports. There are also provisions in the law, for example, for single sex um, associations, which actually, if somebody, if, if sex means legal sex, you would not be able to exclude somebody from an association who, who was male and had a GRC and identified as female from that association. The law doesn't make that provision. So it's a possibility with services, it's not with associations. What does that mean? It means that if you're operating a lesbian-only um, membership organisation, maybe it's like a big lesbian-only reading group, for example. If you've got somebody who comes along and says, um, I may be male, but or you know, or it's obviously male, but I've got a GRC, I'm legally female, you basically cannot exclude someone male from your lesbian-only membership association. There are also huge implications for women accessing who want to access single-sex intimate care. It becomes much, much more difficult if sex means legal sex in the Equality Act. It also becomes more difficult, for example, for a woman in a prison to uh, refuse uh, a strip search from somebody who is male, but a prison officer who is male but identifies as female and has a GRC. So these are really, really significant rights for women that are under threat if the law is unclear. What makes this even more urgent and even more important? So, so far we've sort of muddled along. There's a lack of clarity about the law. It is 100% affecting some women on the ground. We know that. But there aren't actually that many people with GRCs um, because of the way that the process works at the moment. The thing that has really thrust this into the spotlight has been the um, lobby to reform the gender recognition process to make it far easier, a form of self-ID. So we've seen that debate play out in Scotland. We've now got the Labour Party, which has actually moved back from that position, which I think is a really fantastic thing, and that is down to the work of a lot of women, including in this room. But there are still questions about what Labour's agenda for the, um, the, what, for the gender recognition process are. So they say they want to demedicalise it. Um, they've, you know, there have been suggestions around, for example, of having only one doctor sign off. 
essentially it could become self-ID um, by the back door. So this is still a very much alive issue and the law is not in the right place anyway. We've, got, we've now had an intervention from the EHRC about a year ago that said that on balance, they looked at it very carefully, it's a very neutral letter, I really recommend reading it, but on balance the law should be amended to become clear because unclear law is bad law. People need to know and they need to understand what Parliament meant when they're reading the law. And that's true if you're a really big organisation, but it's also true, I've got a friend who um, offers a writing course, uh, once a year, residential writing retreat, and it happens to be for women, many of whom are survivors of severe sexual uh, trauma. Um, I've just realised I've not got much time left, so I'm gonna, gonna, gonna okay. finish up soon. Um, but, um, and, and she's a one-person operator, and she's, you know, she's, I, I introduced her to a lawyer, she um, sought their advice, I mean it wasn't formal legal advice, but the, the answer was, yeah, it is unclear and you would be at risk of being sued. So it has a chilling effect, it prevents people uh, providing services for women. So that is why the law needs to be changed. And just the very last thing I want to say is that Labour's existing position is legally illiterate. It says that it wants to protect single sex spaces for women. It does not acknowledge the lack of clarity in the law, it, it's pretending that the law is clear even though we've literally got a pending case with the Supreme Court because the law is so unclear. And it says, well, we do believe in single-sex spaces for women, sometimes called safe spaces, which is not the accurate term. Um, but uh, we're going to fix it through guidance. That is legally illiterate. The law is the law. Parliament makes the law. The courts interpret it. It matters what the courts say about this unclear law. What the government issues in statutory guidance is irrelevant. The government has to issue it in relation to how the courts interpret the law. So it is just plain wrong for Labour to say there is no issue here, it doesn't need clarification, and we can fix it through guidance. It can't. <laughs> Thanks, Sonia. Uh, she went to 15 minutes, not 10, so that's absolutely <laughs> fine. I wasn't stopping you, you were on a roll. Okay, Anna, over to you. You, you can do a little bit more than 10, that's fine. <laughs> I'm going to go for eight. Um, I'm going to stand up and say hi. Uh, my notes are on my laptop because my printer broke, so I'm going to have to sit down to read, so apologies. I'll, I'll say hi again later. Okay, so thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm in part really honoured and in part just a little bit in awe of, of being here with Sonia and Reen. Um, so you mentioned time to think in the introduction, um, but my focus today won't be on the past, but on where we are now and the future. Because I think we are at a crucial point in time when it comes to how we as a country help our gender questioning children. As I'm sure most of you know, the CAS review came out this year. For anyone who isn't familiar with it, this was a landmark independent review commissioned by NHS England. They asked Dr. Cass to review the existing gender services for children and to make recommendations about what type of care these children should receive moving forwards. Can you put the microphone? Sorry, can you not? Okay, sorry. Um, care that meets their needs is safe, holistic and effective. She published her findings in April. And some of her findings were unequivocal. Cass confirmed with empirical evidence things that we already knew. Over the past 10 to 15 years, we've seen an unprecedented and unexplained increase in young people identifying as transgender and questioning their gender. At the same time, we've seen an unexplained change in the demographics of this group of kids. It's changed from being predominantly natal male with lifelong gender-related distress, to being predominantly, upwards of 70% now, natal females, with many with a, uh, a later onset of distress. And we know now, for sure, that as a group, these young people are more likely to be what we clinicians call complex. They are more likely to have comorbid mental health problems, to be same-sex attracted, to be on the autistic spectrum, or to have experienced negative life events, such as abuse and trauma, than other young people. The CAS review also describes how, across a similar time period, we have seen the introduction of a novel approach for managing gender-related distress in our young people. The medical affirmative model, broadly, involves affirming a young person's felt identity, 
offering puberty blockers from the brink of puberty, followed by cross-sex hormones in later adolescence, and then the options of surgeries in adulthood. The gender affirmative model then is a very significant intervention with the potential for profound, lifelong, wanted and unwanted physical changes. <coughs> so, Cass independently commissioned the University of York to look at the evidence for this new treatment. And in response to the seven systematic reviews that they conducted for her, she concluded that the evidence base for this significant intervention is remarkably weak. As a result, the then government placed a temporary ban on puberty blockers, which Wes Streeting made permanent when he came into office. Well done, Wes. <laughs> Instead, Cass recommends holistic, individualised and a predominantly psychosocial therapeutic approach for supporting gender-questioning kids. Something I agree is necessary in order to meet the wildly different needs present in this group. To give you a flavour of the diversity of this work, I want to talk you through an imaginary therapy clinic. We psychologists love a role play. <laughs> so imagine now, if we're honest, 90% of our doctorate is role play. So imagine now, if you will, that you are the therapist. When I do this, I like to channel Dr. Orna from Couples Therapy, but get into role however you choose. So you're in your clinic. Your first patient might be a 15-year-old girl who transitioned to live as male in an all-girls school. <coughs> Just last month. They tell you that this is going really well so far. They feel understood and seen for the first time ever, and they've just started dating the girl who wouldn't even look at them before. This adolescent wants to know from you how to access puberty blockers, now that bad Hillary Cass has had them banned. Your second client today might be a young, highly functioning trans man who has been taking testosterone via a private clinic for several years. He might say to you, I'm not here to question my identity, but I do need somebody I can trust to help me to decide whether to have surgery or not. Next up in your clinic today is a detransitioned woman in her early 20s who could ask you tearfully, and not for the first time, why did no one tell me I might ever get this wrong? Why did no one ever even question me? And finally, a teenager with a crippling history of trauma and OCD might ask you, am I gay? Am I trans? These questions are driving me mad. Gender questioning and trans-identified young people are not one group, and to treat them as if they are is risky. For some young people, their gender identity feels like a cherished and essential part of themselves that is beyond question. For others, it is something they try on, sometimes fleetingly, as part of a normal process of identity exploration. And as Cass points out, when we professionals meet them, we can't tell, in fact, nobody can tell, whose gender identity will persist and whose will not. And that is why I think that the CAST review was right to recommend extreme caution around any irreversible medical pathway. So far, so good. Then, in the King's speech background briefing on the 17th of July, 2024, the Labour government committed its, to its draft bill to deliver on their manifesto commitment. The manifesto says, Labour will finally deliver a full trans-inclusive ban on conversion practices, whilst protecting the freedom for people to explore their sexual orientation and gender identity. And what could possibly be wrong with that? I mean, what right-minded person wouldn't want to ban conversion practices? But the devil here is in the detail. Firstly, let's get real. Conversion and aversion practices were once practiced by therapists in the NHS with same-sex attracted adults. These practices were often punishing and included horrors such as electric shock treatment, electric shock treatment uh, and induced vomiting. 
There is no evidence that this is happening today, and certainly not with children, because that would be illegal. But it did happen, and in my opinion, we mustn't minimise the suffering of this previous generation of gay adults by appropriating their experiences and misapplying them to a new generation of gender-questioning children. Bear with me. Because that is what is happening. Some people who call themselves trans allies argue that the individualized and holistic therapeutic approach that CAS is recommending is conversion therapy. They are arguing that these children have a right to medical affirmation and treatments, regardless of the gaps in the evidence base or the risks, and that to offer anything else is equivalent to the crimes committed against gay adults in the past. Every clinician I know who works in a responsible, cast-aligned way has already been called a conversion therapist. Wes Streeting has been called a conversion therapist. Uh, it's absurd. As far as I'm aware, he's not even a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you never know. Side hustle. He's very talented. He's a bright boy. But it worries me. If these malicious accusations are already being made, what will happen once this passes into law? Some clinicians already seem to be more afraid of being called a conversion therapist than of offering unevidenced medical treatments to children. And the biggest risk here, as Cass says, is that good professionals might avoid working with gender-questioning children altogether at a time when we need them most, which would be a tragedy. Secondly, the manifesto speaks about trans people as if we all know exactly what that means, as if that is one easily defined group of people and is as if the membership of that group doesn't change. But trans, Stonewall tells us, is an umbrella term that can include binary and non-binary people and the gender fluid. People, especially young people, can and do move between identity categories. And assuming that anything is permanent and fixed in childhood or adolescence goes against everything we know about child development. So this bill needs careful scrutiny from both houses, plus extensive consultation and stakeholder engagement to ensure that it is developmentally informed and doesn't inadvertently make things worse for our young people. These children do need to be protected. And in part, this means allowing them to go through identity exploration without the influence of activists or politicians. And the professionals who might be the ones helping them, they need protecting too. So to wrap up, how am I doing for time? Good. Yeah. <laughs> so to wrap up, the CAST review is the longest and most comprehensive piece of work that's ever been conducted into gender identity. I am proud that our country, despite the hostile climate, has taken the time to think and attend to this group of vulnerable children and their needs. We are leading the world on this. NHS England has dedicated hundreds of thousands of hours, and no doubt pounds, to exploring the question of how best to help them. It is crucial, then, that Labour's Conversion Practices Bill, however well intended, doesn't inadvertently undermine the implementation of the cash review in full. Because the only way to, be, to really be an ally is through protecting children, their clinicians, and evidence-based practice itself. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. That was absolutely brilliant. And um, now uh, I'm going to pass over to the wonderful Reem. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, very pleased to be here in my first day. <laughs> Thank you so much to uh, Labour Women's Declaration uh, for the invitation and also I'm very pleased to be here with these lovely ladies uh, on a very important topic. Uh, I'm going to be speaking to four issues. One is uh, the commitment to have um, 
violence against women and girls. The other is the meaning of sex, also in international law. The third is the CAS review, and also with that, uh, the, uh, the plans to, to ban uh, conversion <coughs> therapies. If you allow me, I'm going to sit down also because I have uh, a piece of paper that has a small font. Uh, so uh, I, I will be <coughs> speaking uh, to that. So with regards to having uh, vi male violence against women, as you know, and as was said, I was in the UK on an official visit back in February. And the report of that visit will still come out in, in June, which you might think may be a long time from now. But in a way, it's also a good thing because we had a change of government. Uh, and also, it will be able, I will be able to take stock of everything that has happened since uh, my visit. Uh, it is definitely uh, welcome that uh, Labour government uh, has committed to having violence against women and girls. Uh, I do uh, feel strongly though that all governments, including Labour government, must really walk that talk and must commit to that uh, at the highest level, consider this really a priority. I've, as I've said in my end of statement uh, to, uh, after the visit to the UK, uh, the UK is very much a leader when it comes to uh, issues of discrimination and violence. It has a robust legal framework. It has a very uh, also active and vibrant civil society uh, or organizations and feminist movement. And in that way also I very much agree that you have really set, uh, set an example and uh, are looked uh, to uh, really uh, around the world on what is possible when a robust legal framework and uh, activism and a principled approach come together. So, uh, and, and also the, the UK really is, was one of the, and is still one of the first countries really to always tackle um, emerging issues of violence against women. So whether it's through legislation or policies, like for example, legislating on economic forms of violence, on coercive control, um, on um, yeah, digitally facilitated violence and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I would say that um, it has really um, um, maybe sabotaged its own efforts, if I can use that, uh, that phrase, because as we know, violence against women and girls is not a statutory uh, matter, and there is also no clear approach to non-devolved uh, powers and how they impact women and girls on issues particularly relating to immigration, asylum, and just other classical forms of violence, uh, like domestic violence, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And references to violence against women and girls is very much scattered throughout different pieces of legislation. Perhaps the, the most clear uh, form of legislation that is relevant is the Equality Act, but everything else is sort of scattered around and sits in different portfolios with, with different uh, uh, ministries. So in that statement, in fact, I had uh, recommended uh, the UK to uh, adopt a central framework that brings together all the strands relating to violence against women and girls under one roof and also to strengthen the framing of uh, uh, its policy and legal framework uh, to center it in a human rights uh, framework and to really give meaning to women's rights or human rights, which I think is still missing. And therefore, I also recommended the creation of a ministry for women and equality with a separate cabinet minister and brief. Uh, related to that, uh, I felt very strongly that um, this cutting of resources to frontline organizations, to services has to stop. It keeps going on and on, uh, not just in the UK, but also all governments that have austerity uh, measures. And that you need to address the gender bias and the impunity uh, that exists for uh, acts of violence against women and girls, including racism, uh, which we know is, is quite uh, uh, widespread in a number of uh, institutions and other forms of uh, discrimination. We must also uh, tackle all aspects of violence together, yeah? So avoiding a piecemeal approach uh, because it's all interconnected. So we have to look at violence in family courts, in prostitution, in pornography, 
what it means in surrogacy, in prison, in sport, what it means for foreign women in the UK, including asylum seekers and refugees. So we cannot have a, you know, we cannot do this, but not that part, because it all uh, fits uh, together. And uh, we must therefore also be concerned about the safety, dignity, and security of all women that are present in the UK, be they nationals or foreign, uh, but also women and girls that are outside of the UK. And the reason I mention this is because, of course, one of the things that the UK leads on is also uh, the way in which it has made gender equality a core focus of its international development efforts. And we know, for example, that the UK uh, was the one that launched this international initiative, right, on preventing sexual violence in conflict. But here, again, the UK needs to walk the talk. And by that, I mean, um, if you look at Palestine-Israel, yes, of course, the UK rightly denounced any acts of sexual violence committed against uh, uh, Israeli women on the 7th of October, but it has failed to show the same outrage with regards to sexual violence committed against Palestinians, including women. And uh, that, frankly, means that as a minimum, there needs to be not just more uh, concerted efforts to reach a ceasefire, but also the imposition of a full arms embargo on Israel, because the majority of those that are being killed in this unfolding genocide, as we know, are women uh, and children. And of course, when it comes to Afghanistan, uh, there needs to be also a, a lot more pressure in order to reverse this uh, unacceptable uh, denial and erasure of women in Afghanistan, which is clearly a situation of discrimination and violence and gender and sex persecution, I would say, rather than uh, gender pers persecution. With regards to clarifying the meaning of uh, sex to be biological sex, um, just perhaps to frame that also uh, within the context of my visit to the UK, Back in February, uh, it was very clear that uh, having good disaggregated data uh, was a, a big challenge that hampered uh, the efforts. And one of the things that is clearly missing is sex also, uh, uh, that is uh, disaggregated alongside sex. And that makes it clear that what we mean when we collect sex uh, data is biological sex. And of course, this is really important because we know that violence against women and girls is male violence against females. And therefore, if we don't collect that kind of data, we lose the understanding of what the issue is. And then we uh, have problems in designing and implementing adequate uh, responses. Uh, and then, of course, when it comes to femicide, it's really important that we, in addition to sex, age, uh, gender, disaggregated da data, we also uh, collect data that shows clearly the relationship between perpetrator and victim. Uh, and that also is missing, and data is collected differently in the different uh, devolved uh, um, areas, and, and so it makes comparison, uh, comparison very difficult. As I've said, and as also uh, Anna and uh, Sonia have said, um, I, 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 I mean, the Equality Act is no doubt uh, really um, uh, a standard setter uh, in the sense uh, that uh, it was crafted with a lot of foresight when it made sure that uh, sex, sexual orientation, and gender reassignment were three distinct uh, protected characteristics. And I think it also foresaw to an extent that there would be clashes or tension that would arise between sex and gender reassignment rights and allowed exceptions to permit lawful distinction to be made between men and women in limited circumstances. So it would, for example, uh, allow, as was mentioned, uh, running single sex services in some uh, specific circumstances. Um, however, uh, what we have seen from the UK, but also in other places around the world, is that it's really important to make it very clear what we mean uh, by sex. and that this means actually biological sex. Uh, and uh, I am aware, of course, of the case before the Supreme Court uh, that will examine on appeal precisely that uh, in, in, in the Equality Act, which was brought forward by four women in Scotland. But I agree also that it doesn't necessarily have to be kicked to the courts, right, in order to uh, have that clarity, because of course courts may look at this, yeah, in, in different ways or may not take a decision, as Sonia said. So there is no reason in order to defer this 
uh, only to, uh, to the courts. Uh, when it comes to international human rights law, I've said before, and I continue to reiterate, that while the terms man, woman, or sex were not defined explicitly, if we are to interpret terms in accordance with the ordinary meaning that was given to them, which is what we should do when we look at international uh, treaties, then the only way to understand sex is biological uh, sex. Um, with regards to the CAST review, I have, uh, of course, followed that also uh, and, and had uh, spoken to this uh, during my visit, but also after. I'm very happy that um, the UK uh, and all authorities in the UK have now committed to implement the CAS review and uh, very much agree that, again, the UK led uh, with regards to this review because it has had a ripple effect and has affected also how other countries that uh, have uh, gender um, uh, approaches to, their, to, to children that have gender dysphoria or other uh, distresses uh, deal with the issue. Uh, and they have become a lot more cautious uh, as a result of the, the CAS review. So uh, I'm very <laughs> pleased to see that and very much also agree that um, uh, the fact that a large number of uh, children that come seeking or are referred to, the, to gender clinics are girls should concern all of us and is really primarily the reason why I have spoken uh, about this. Because uh, it is very uh, consistent also with what <coughs> we see uh, from other information that there is an increasing distress that adolescent girls face uh, and that I think is brought about also by the increasing sexualization of women and girls, including adolescent girls, through many things, including uh, the normalization <coughs> of the buying of sexual acts, mm -hmm. but also the uh, consumption of pornography, including by uh, adolescent boy. So being female uh, or the femaleness uh, uh, is becoming more <coughs> difficult to handle, in, including for our uh, young girls, and may very well be one of the reasons also why girls choose to reject their femaleness. And, and so we do indeed need to provide the time and space to make full inquiries of the causes of distress, rather than fast-track children under a path of gender transition that begins with puberty blockers often, but results in more permanent changes with long-lasting consequences. And there's been many studies that have shown the, the actual also uh, negative health consequences uh, of that. So uh, I think uh, children and, uh, of course, adults, I'm not excluding adults from that, are also uh, also have a right to, to know what they are getting into and the full consequences of the past that they choose uh, and to be able to make an informed decision. They also, adults uh, that have uh, uh, distresses of that sort, have also uh, a right to the highest standard of mental and physical health. Um, and finally, on therefore conversion therapy bans, I haven't seen the plans by uh, the Labour uh, government. I don't think they are yet spelled out uh, very concretely, but very much also agree that governments in general should not rush to adopt uh, all-encompassing uh, sort of trans-inclusive bans on conversion therapy without uh, considering the wider consequences and harms that uh, that may cause, particularly, I would say, on children, including uh, girls. And, and such a ban uh, would make it actually easier to also fast track um, children and adults uh, that are same sex attracted, that may be autistic, that may have other uh, also concerns on path of irreversible medical gender uh, transition. So I will leave it at that and uh, looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you.